Hello there, Pastor Josh Yelton here at Redemption Church. I just want to take a second and say thank you for watching this sermon recording. I truly hope and pray that it is an encouragement to you. And if it is, would you please consider giving to Redemption Church? You can do that by going to our website, redemptiongillette.com. Again, I just pray that this is a blessing and an encouragement to you. Thank you for watching. Uh, like uh, like I was just introduced, my name is Jacob Cooper. I'm from Casper. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. I mean that sincerely. Uh, it's always a, a, a great honor to, uh, to get to meet and share the word with God's church uh, where I'm not from. Uh, and so uh, thank you for being here. I'm glad that... Uh, that God, even in Gillette, Wyoming, is here and working and thriving, and he has you here uh, for a purpose, and I'm thankful for that. Uh, hopefully today as we uh, look at God's word that he'll show us something uh, for you here uh, in Gillette and for me and Casper and for uh, wherever God's word is, is read. Uh, if you have your Bibles with you today, go ahead and turn them to Isaiah chapter 6. Uh, we'll be reading the whole chapter today. Uh, a little bit about myself, uh, I have grown up in church. My father is the pastor uh, at the church I go to. He's been a pastor for as long as I can remember. Uh, he, he was starting to be a pastor when I was very young. Uh, he's been uh, in the ministry consistently since then, so I've grown up in church. I haven't always been a believer like most pastor's kids, or at least some pastor's kids. Uh, there's that old saying, you know, pastor's kids are the worst. Well, I was no exception to that rule by any means, um, but... By the grace of God, uh, he, he brought me under his wing and, and forgave me of my sins, and, and I get to be here with you today. Uh, so uh, Isaiah 6 is actually the passage that uh, was preached at the time of my salvation, and so this passage means a lot to me. Uh, as Josh knows, in fact, uh, Josh and a good friend of mine, a pastor in Buffalo, uh, a friend of Josh and mine, his name is Reuben, uh, as Josh was talking to Reuben about uh, me preaching, Reuben responded with these words. He said, you know he cries when he preaches, right? And Josh said, that's okay. I heard his dad preach and my dad does the same thing. I am an emotional guy and for some of you that may be awkward and I apologize for that, but uh, this passage specifically means a great deal to me. Uh, like I said, it was a passage that was preached uh, when, I, when God called me and when I was saved. And so it has meant a lot to me uh, through the years uh, and so I get to, to preach this to you. I I would love to share this message every day of my life sometimes, I think. Uh, it's, it's truly great. And so I hope as we read and as we discuss what's going on that you will uh, just be open and attentive to what the Lord uh, not just said to me but has to say to you here. I think there's a decent amount. So we'll begin reading in verse 1. We'll read to the end of the chapter. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up. And the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him stood the seraphim. Each had six wings, with two he covered his face, and with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the foundations of the threshold shook at the voice of him who called, and the house was filled with smoke. And I said, Woe is me, for I am lost, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips, for my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts." Then one of the seraphim flew to me, having in his hand a burning coal that he had taken with tongs from the altar. And he touched my mouth and said, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away and your sin atoned for. And I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? Then I said, Here I am, send me. And he said, Go and say to this people, Keep on hearing but do not understand. Keep on seeing but do not perceive. Make the heart of this people dull and their ears heavy and blind their eyes lest they see with their eyes and hear with their ears, and understand with their hearts, and turn and be healed. Then I said, How long, O Lord? He said, Until cities lie waste without inhabitant, and houses without people, and the land is a desolate waste, and the Lord removes people far away, and the forsaken places are many in the midst of the land. And though a tenth remain in it, it will be burned again, like a terebinth or an oak, whose stump remains when it is felled. The holy seed is its stump. Let's pray. God, I thank you for your word. Lord, I thank you that you have given it to us so we can know you, that we can know you at an intimate level, God, that you have called us uh, to have a relationship with you. Lord, I ask that as we look at your word today that you would 
uh, speak through me, God, that the words that come from my mouth are strictly from you. Lord, I ask that you would uh, speak to the hearts and the minds of the people here, that they would hear you and that they would be transformed by your word. And Lord, I ask that your word would accomplish that which it is set out to do. I pray these things in your name. Amen. Okay. So a bit of background on uh, the situation. Uh, It's always been interesting to me that this is Isaiah chapter 6. It almost feels like it should be chapter 1. And if you go through the book of Isaiah, it kind of just jumps in. Isaiah is just kind of doing his thing, being a prophet. And then we get to Isaiah 6, and he kind of tells the story of how he became a prophet, how God called him to be a prophet. And so we get the very first sentence, not even the first sentence, the first phrase, in the year that King Uzziah died. Uh, interesting factoid, if you will, about Isaiah and King Uzziah. They were cousins. Uh, so King Uzziah, for Isaiah, would have been a close relative. They, they for sure knew each other. Isaiah was from the upper crust, if you will, of the, the people of Judah. So this was a man of stature. Uh, he was also a priest serving in the temple. Uh, in fact, the temple is where uh, Isaiah was during this uh, vision that he has. And so for this to be the year that King Uzziah died implies something pretty specific to us. Uh, For one, it implies that Isaiah would have been going through uh, maybe a somewhat tumultuous time. I'm sure uh, some of us in here have lost family members that we were close to. uh, So he had that aspect going on with him and King Uzziah. But more than that, the the people of Judah would have been going through a tumultuous time as well. Uh, King Uzziah was not, he was was actually a pretty great king for Judah. Uh, He was uh, very successful in his military endeavors. Uh, economically, the, the people of Judah had been having one of the best times they'd had it with King Uzziah. Uh, but King Uzziah was not necessarily known for being upright. Uh, in fact, if you read back in 2 Kings, uh, you'll read the story of King Uzziah. Uh, after this, this kind of uh, great victory, he goes and he, uh, he wants to offer uh, incense before the Lord in the temple. And so some of the priests, uh, a few, like 10, 30 of them, uh, they, they kind of get together and they're like, whoa, 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 you're not allowed to do this. This is only for the priests. And uh, Excuse me. It says that King Uzziah was getting angry, and as he was getting angry, the Lord smote him with leprosy on his forehead. And so from that time point on, King Uzziah still reigned, but he had to reign uh, while being secluded. And so he would have uh, reigned kind of through his son Jotham. Uh, and so this year uh, is kind of this tumultuous time. We, we can understand as the people of Judah are, are losing their king, that for one, while he was a great king, his son It's hard to say what's going to happen. He's also kind of been uh, withdrawn, and so we're not really sure what this transition of power is going to look like. Is somebody going to make a play for the kinghood, uh, kingship? Uh, Is somebody going to just let Jotham reign, or or what's going to happen? Not only that, there's a couple big powers that have been coming through, uh, and you'll notice uh, as you read the book of Isaiah, uh, the the country of Babylon comes through, this kind of small country, and uh, and they, they, they go through and they get to share everything, right? Uh, they, they show the people of Babylon everything. Not only that, Assyria is a big major power at this time, and they've kind of been moving in. Uh, and so the, the world itself is not a peaceful, enjoyable place. And for this to be the year that King Uzziah died means that change is coming, and we are in this period of, of unknowing. And I don't know about you, but I like knowing. It's my favorite thing. In fact, uh, I was an arguer in high school and college. I was captain of my debate team uh, both at Kelly Walsh High School but also Casper College and King's College in New York. And and I was able to just, I'm an arguer. I I love being right. It's just who I am as a person. Uh, If you want to argue with me after the sermon, you can pick and I'll just go to town. Like let's, it'll be a great time for me, I promise you. So that's, that's who I am as a person. So I love knowing, I love being right. And this time period would have been rough for me. And I think Isaiah is pretty similar, right? Because of what happens next. It says that in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up. He, God here doesn't come to Isaiah as this kind of loving, uh, relational, best friend God, right? And we have that idea of God, right? Throughout the New Testament, we get uh, a picture of God to, to be this uh, to God at some point in time, right? We know that uh, he's adopted us as sons and daughters, it tells us, right? That we can be friends, right? The greater love has no man than this, that he laid down his life for his friend, which Christ did for us, right? Implying that we are friends of God. But for Isaiah, God doesn't show up as this. He shows up high, lifted up, 
above Isaiah sitting on his throne. Right? For Isaiah, what Isaiah needed at this moment in time was for God to be in control. And God shows up for Isaiah in control, saying regardless of what's going on here, regardless of what happened with King Uzziah, I am in control. Right? I'm on my throne. I'm high, lifted up. I'm above all of the kings of this earth. Regardless of what happens here, I still reign. It's the very thing that Isaiah needed in this moment, right? So he shows up, he's high and lifted up, and it says the train of his robe filled the temple. I love this imagery because we know that God as king is is being portrayed right here sitting on his throne, but notice the position that God takes on earth. God's glory descends from this place on high and his train fills the temple. Right, this temple that was supposed to be God's dwelling place, Isaiah gets a glimpse here where he realizes God doesn't just simply dwell in the temple. God is so much grander, so much bigger than this local kind of God that, that the people might have had this idea of. Right? Just the train of his robe filled the temple. Right? God is not some local deity. He is this God that is above all, bigger than all, and his, his bounds know no limit. Right? And it's this great thing that Isaiah needs, and I think this is something we need to realize as we go through this as well. Next it says, Above him stood the seraphim. Each had six wings. With two he covered his face, with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. Again, this is some imagery here that I think is unbelievably important. Uh, The seraphim are mentioned a few times throughout the Bible. Uh, One of the consistent things that they have is they have six wings. If you read about them in Revelation, you'll see that these wings were covered in eyes, at least in this vision that John was given. Uh, But here we we notice that the the first time, I guess, it's brought up is that they have six wings and that they, they do certain things with their wings. When they're in the presence of God, two of their wings are covering their face. This is important, right, because we understand that even angelic beings, these beings that we kind of see as almost above us, uh, while the Bible tells us they're jealous of our ability to know Christ so intimately, uh, we see that even in the presence of God, these beings are unable to look at the glory and the holiness of God. Just his presence alone is too much for them. They cannot appear it. When we read through the Old Testament multiple times, God shows up very directly in the lives of people, and each time uh, it tells us that man cannot look at God or he would surely die. Right? When he shows up to, to Moses in Genesis, or sorry, Moses in Exodus, uh, we see that he is only able to see the back of God. He says, I will pass in front of you because if you were to see me, you could not survive it. Right, so we have this vision of God that even the angels are unable to look at them. With two of their wings, they cover their face. With two of their wings, they cover their feet. This is, again, some pretty important imagery for especially Isaiah and the people of Judah. Uh, the feet, especially back then, would have been the dirtiest part of a person. I mean, undoubtedly, this is for sure the, the uncleanest part of a person. They spend all day walking. They didn't have these great sneakers and things that we have today. And so their feet were filthy. And this maintained itself through the time of Christ and well after that. So for an angel to be covering its wings, it understands that the the simple thing that is unclean is not able to enter into the presence of God. Their feet, this thing that is unclean, needs to be covered because God is so perfect that no uncleanness is able to enter into his presence. And then with two, they fly. The ability to fly uh, for an angel uh, is not just cool, which it is. Uh, I'd love to be able to fly. Can't. I'll I'll try later if you want, but it's not going to work well. Uh, But for them, it's their mode of transportation, right? And and the reason they need to move around is because God gives them a word to do something, and they go and do it. So we see that each set of wings has this necessity to it. They cannot look at the face of God because of his holiness. They cannot have their unclean feet in the presence of God, again, because of his holiness, and they are ready to do exactly what it is that he is telling them to do. Right, God in this spiritual realm that shows Isaiah that not only am I king of the earth, above the kings, and able to be not just locally bound but everywhere, I am holy in heaven. Right, and we know this to be true because the angels say it. Right, let's read. It says the angels shout and they say to one another, "Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of His glory." This, this repetition of the word holy is important, especially in the Hebrew language. Uh, there's, there's many times uh, the Bible talks about these, these great pits in Genesis. And, and that's what my Bible says, at least, is, is great pits. And uh, for a Hebrew person, uh, they would not say great pits. They would say pit pits. 
Right? That's, that's literally transcribed to mean these great pits, and it means really big because if you want to define like the essence or the superlative, the absolute best of something, you repeated it. Right? And so if you wanted to say, like, this is the world's best pizza, you would say this is pizza pizza. Right? I'm looking for pizza pizza. That is like my goal in life. I love that stuff. But one of these days, and it's like yeah, Little Caesars, right? I mean, you have this like concept, and it's not. But, but that's the idea, right? You have pizza pizza. So for these angels to be saying God is holy, 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 this is unlike anything else. Right? This is not just the most holy thing, because holy, holy would imply the absolute limit, the, the, the perfection of holiness. God is more holy than perfection. He is holy, holy, holy. Right? For, for the, the, the local reader, the local hearer, for Isaiah to hear that, it would have been uncomprehendable the level of holiness that God has for the angels, these perfect beings, to say, holy, holy, holy is the Lord. We don't always get that, right? Because we sing that song, holy, holy, holy. Right? It's easy, right? I love that song. I always have growing up. But, but we miss that because we don't have the same language. We don't do that, right? There's no words able to describe the holiness the angels are giving to God here. We cannot comprehend it. Right? And so this is the interaction that God has, not just on earth, but also in the heavens with the angels. And it leads to one of my favorite things about the glory of God, is that as this glory descends from his place on high, the Bible tells us that the foundations of the threshold of the temple shake, and it fills with smoke. Now, we got to hear uh, in first, uh, first, or what was it, Second Corinthians today? or whatever the, the passage was, uh, about the temple, right? Uh, sorry, I, I didn't write it down. It's over there for me. Uh, but we got to hear about all of these things that were put into the temple. This was no small building. This was no, uh, like, slight, you know, even, even room like this. For this thing to shake on its foundations would have been impressive. And what's really interesting is that the glory of God, this word that they use uh, in, in Hebrew is kavod. And kavod, while we translate it to mean glory, can also mean weight, like heaviness, right? And so the glory descends from heaven, and as this weight hits the earth, as it descends upon the temple, it shakes things, right? Because we don't get a God who is passive. We get a God that when he shows up, it's calamity, right? It, it's, this, it's this moment of hugeness descending and destroying or collapsing or shaking the very foundations of these things on earth, right? Because God is bigger than that. His weight is way greater than, than even the temple could withstand, right? And so we, we have this, this kind of whole scenario presenting itself to Isaiah, this guy who, for most parts, on all accounts, has been living a pretty good life. He's a well-off individual. His family has been well-off. He's serving in the temple, doing exactly what he is supposed to be doing. Uh, he, he's able to, to mingle with the upper echelon of society, while at the same time uh, mingling at the temple with, with kind of everybody, right? This was a man that you wanted to be. This was a man that you would, you would have admired and would have had kind of these aspirations to, to be close to him, right? If I could get close to Isaiah, I'd be okay, right? He's the inner circle that I need, right? And so Isaiah sees this encounter with God, and it leads us to our first reaction to a holy God, which is realization. And Isaiah says these things, and I said, woe is me, for I am lost, and we read that, and we use this word woe pretty, or somewhat consistently maybe, depending on the circles. If you're a, if you're a big literature fan, you see it in, in a lot of books that you can see. We kind of understand the word woe to mean a sense of sadness, right? And if you Google what does woe mean, you're going to get a, a definition similar to that, right? Maybe a deep sense of sadness or loss or something like that. Well, the word that they use in, in scriptures isn't quite this sense of sadness. It's actually a verb that they use. Woe was considered a curse, Right? And so there are times where Jesus says to the Pharisees, woe to you who X, right? Woe to you who do this thing, right? And what he's saying here is cursed are you to death for doing this thing. 
That's what that means. So for Isaiah to say, woe is me, he is literally laying a curse upon himself, saying, cursed to death am I, for I am lost. Right? I mean, this is an impactful scenario. Isaiah enters the presence of God, and he understands the only possible outcome for him is death. There's nothing else that comes from this scenario. I am doomed. I am cursed to death because I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. You see, when we encounter a holy God as sinners, we can have no realization except for the fact that we are cursed to death because of our sin. You see, God's holiness cannot allow sin and unrighteousness and unholiness into his presence. It's like flicking on a light switch. Darkness doesn't get to stay. It goes away because light is there. And our unrighteousness dissipates, is evaporated, is destroyed and condemned to death because the righteousness of God has shown up and we don't get to coexist. Coexistence is not an option with a holy God with our sin. And Isaiah knows it immediately. This man who's been living a righteous life, serving God in the temple, doing everything right, understands that even in my correct life, even in my righteous life, I am cursed to death because of my sin. And his sin takes a very specific application in his life. Notice that he, sa- he doesn't say, for I am a sinner. He says, I am lost because I'm a man of unclean lips. And I live among a people of unclean lips. The, the sin that Isaiah recognizes is in the words that he speaks. Now, for some of us, we understand that. Right? We understand, yeah, I'm, I'm not the best. Right? If, if I, I'm terrified of snakes. And so if I see a snake, it's possible a word comes out of my mouth that I'm not proud of. Right? We understand that. But I don't think that's the reason Isaiah is specifically recognizing his sin is from his lips. Right? Because Isaiah is a man who was created with the sole purpose of ministering and speaking God's words to the people around him. And when God shows up, the very thing that God intended to use Isaiah for was the very place that Isaiah recognizes his unworthiness, right? God intended to use Isaiah to speak the words of God to the people around him, and yet this is where Isaiah understands I'm lacking the most because I'm a man of unclean lips and I live among a people of unclean lips, Right? And it's this condemnation of the very thing that God intends to use that implies to us we, A, need to realize that our existence in the face of a holy God is futile. There's absolutely nothing we can do of our own accord and of our own nature, even the very best thing that we have, the, the whole purpose that we were created is not good enough for God. It's not good enough to be used by God until something happens. Right? And if we keep reading, we're going to see what happens. Right? It says, Then one of the seraphim flew to me, having in his hand a burning coal that he had taken with tongues from the altar. And he touched my mouth and said, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away and your sin atoned for. Now, this is, this is the best verse in this chapter. Right? It just is. Uh, because there's hope now. Right? Like I said, I knew, I knew I was going to get here. I couldn't do it. But, but Isaiah was in a position of hopelessness, of complete and utter destruction, where he knew that he was cursed to death because of his sin. And yet God shows up, and he doesn't wait for Isaiah to come to him. He sends an angel, an angel with a coal to touch his lips, to atone for the guilt that Isaiah has in the presence of God. And only through God's mercy and God's grace is Isaiah able to be made right with God, right? Because Isaiah is dead. He's a dead man cursed to death. And yet God shows up, reaches out to Isaiah and reforms his life, saves him through only grace that God can offer, right? And and Isaiah is now able to stand. He's now able to to not be cursed to, to death, Right? No longer is woe to Isaiah. It does not exist anymore. He has been made right with a living God, the God who sits on high. 
whose glory knows no bounds and extends through the entire earth. Isaiah is right with this God. And that had to have been the best feeling. I remember the day that I, remember, that I heard this sermon. I was in New York City. I had moved there for a girl because women, right? And, uh, but I had moved there for this girl, and she was a great girl. I hadn't been going to church. I was this kind of really rough and awful individual. And, and this girl, you know, that God used very specifically to get me into church, into this church service, specifically this day, she said, hey, it's Sunday. We're going to church today. And I said, I, I don't really go to church. And she said, when you're with me, you do. Which is a good response, right? I mean, like, because I went. I mean, there were no, okay, yeah, I'm going to church then. I mean, that was the only other option I had. And so I go to church, and this passage is preached, and it was preached one through eight, and, and God wrecked my life that day in the most beautiful way imaginable, right? Because I had always known that God had given me this ability to speak and this ability to, to communicate well. Like I said, it was part of who I was growing up my whole life. But I then realized that this ability that I had, my words and my desires to speak and to influence were nothing. They meant nothing without God's interference, without God touching my lips, without God reconciling me to himself. And man, from that day on, I was ecstatic. I mean, like, I, so again, I'm, I've always been this emotional guy. This sermon was preached. I'm in this balcony of this super fancy church. I mean, like, like super fancy. They had string quartets playing. I mean, it was, it was a super fancy church on the, in, literally off of, uh, of Central Park in New York City. Should not have been there. But God ruined my life, and I was weeping, causing a scene in the, in the balcony of this church. Like, literally, people are looking at, who's this guy who can't control himself? And so I stand up, the sermon is done, and I leave. I don't say anything to Tiffany, the girl I was with, and I just leave because how could anybody love this guy who just did this in this church? And she follows me out and she says, I think that sermon was for you. And I mean, yeah, very clearly it was. Uh, God intended it to, to bring me to him, and, and he did. But I remember from that day on that I couldn't shut up about God. Literally, the same, the same uh, uh, scenario, I, I was at school, and I was going to school, and, and I was just talking to people. I couldn't stop talking to people about Jesus. I was like, man, he's done something in my life, and I'm a different person now. And like, if, if other people knew this, like, 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 people must not know because if people knew, they would want to tell people. And Isaiah has this moment here, right? It says, and I heard the voice of the Lord saying, whom shall I send, and who will go for us? And it says, then I said, here I I am. <laughs> Send me. Right? I, do you know what just happened to me? Uh, an angel took away my guilt. Uh, I, I've been united with Christ. The very reason that I exist has been unified by God and I am free. I want to go. God send me. Right? Which, which is the second reaction. We respond according to what God has called us to do. Right? We often have this question in our minds. God, what is my purpose. What have you called me to? Where do you want me to serve? And God is saying, I already know where I want you to serve. I just need you there to do it. Right? He leaves that up to us, which is insane, I think. I, I mean, that blows my mind sometimes, right? Because God knows me. He knows everything I've ever done, everything I'm going to do, everything I'm doing. He, he knows it all. Why would he even let me try? Why would he even let me attempt to serve him? I'm, I'm the worst pick imaginable, right? I, I, I'm, I'm the guy with, with no ability, and you're picking me first for dodgeball? Like, that doesn't make any sense at all, right? And so God asks for volunteers. He says, I need someone to go for me. Who will it be? And Isaiah, because of what God has done in his life, is eager, he says, yeah, that's me. Like, like nobody else, there's nobody else here, but if there was, I'm still your guy. Like they can all take a back seat. I need to go now. I want to serve this God who has redeemed me, who has given my life not just purpose, but meaning and effectiveness. He has made me able to accomplish that which I was created to do. So yeah, God, send me because I want to go for you. 
And for some of us, that's where we're at today, right? I mean, I mean, legitimately, we are at a place where we need to go because of what God has done for us in our lives. We then ought to return our life service to him, right? So, so he says, here am I, send me. And I love and hate this next part because, oh man, it's, it's brutal. I mean, I mean, really. And so God says to Isaiah, go and say to this people, and then a list of things that nobody wants to hear. I mean, really, right? If we read through this, let's go ahead. It says, tell, tell these people, your neighbors, your friends, the people that you've known your whole life, tell these people, keep on hearing, but do not understand. Keep on seeing, but do not perceive. It says to Isaiah, make their hearts dull. Make their hearts unresponsive. Make their hearts not desire life. That'd be tough. Their ears heavy, blind their eyes, so that they won't see with their ears, or sorry, see with their eyes, or hear with their ears. Now, when I was saved, I was like, I wanted everyone to know. I, I, we still should want everyone to know, right? And, and I should be like, yeah, let's go. You need to know this Jesus who, who saved my whole life, who loved me in spite of me, who loved me in spite of the fact that I hated him very openly, right? Who loved me and sought me. I, I should want everyone to know. And God now says, Isaiah, in this moment of ecstasy, in this moment of desire to serve, in this moment where you are, are more on fire than you may ever be again, you need to go and tell people so that they can't have the same opportunity you just did. So that they won't listen to the very words that you just heard. So that they won't receive the same mercy and grace that you just received. That would be devastating. If, if we knew that we were called to talk to people about Jesus so that they couldn't know him? Oh, it'd kill me. I, I don't know if I could do it. Honestly, I, I don't know. And Isaiah has a response here that, that breaks me. He says, how long, oh Lord? How long until I get to share and people hear? Until I get to share and people receive the same mercy and the same grace that I received. How long? And God responds. And it's not this happy ending even. Right? It's, it's not this response that we, that we want for Isaiah. Right? We've been taken on this journey for him where he is just at the height of who he is in relation to God. And he says, how long do I have to do this? And God says, essentially... Until I accomplish that which I've told you I'm going to. He says, until what I said comes true. Until these people are dull in their hearts and they don't hear with their ears and they don't see with their eyes. Until the foundations of this place lie in ruin. Until somebody comes and they take everybody. And even then, a tenth of what was here will remain and then again it'll happen to them. Until then, you teach what I tell you to teach. Right, which is my third reaction then to a holy God. And I call this one resolution. And I don't mean like, you know, like this thing that is resolved. I mean to be resolved in the calling that God has for our lives. Right, this is something that God tells Isaiah, you are to continue with this message. This message that would not be easy for anybody. You are to continue with this message until my word accomplishes that which I set it out to accomplish. And it does. Right? If you know the story of Judah and of Israel, this happens. Right? Not, not during King Jotham even, the, the king after Uzziah. But it happens. Right? The, the Assyrians show up, they, they decimate Israel. And, and the Babylonians show up and they, they take all the people into exile. And Israel's like, hey, we can still kind of fight against them. So they do. And Babylon shows up again and just destroys everything. They tear the temple down. They, they, they just take everything away. They salt the fields. They burn the whole city. It's just devastation. And, and that's, a, that's a tough thing, I think, for us to hear. Right? Because 
when we are called, we have these visions, right? I, I know that as I was praying and, and preparing for, to come up here and preach that, God, I ask that you move. I ask that you work. I ask that people respond. I ask, I ask all these things, right? Because when we envision ourselves performing the things that God has called us to, we envision it working. We envision people responding accordingly. But sometimes God sh- says no. Sometimes God doesn't give that, right? And, and that's hard, right? Because when we have and we serve in ministry where nothing seems to be happening, then we think, well, this ministry isn't worth it. And so I'm just going to quit and we'll go do something else. And that's tough because sometimes God has put us in that ministry not for it to work, but so that we can walk closer and closer with God. Right? And if you read through Isaiah, there's some rough things that happen to Isaiah, but one thing remains true is that Isaiah walked with God. And his relationship with God was greater than anything I can possibly imagine or fathom for myself or anyone here. Right? Because even though it didn't work like maybe we'd want it to, God showed himself to Isaiah and that's ultimately what we're called to, right, is to walk with God, even in those ministries and those, those places where it's difficult, where we don't have this rapturous audience and that, you know, 30,000 people come to know the Lord, right? We're not all Billy Graham, right? But the fact of the matter is true is that we are called to still walk according to the, the purpose that God has called us to, right? So there's some of us here today who... As we, as we hear God's word, we need to respond, how long, O oh Lord? How long do you want me here in this ministry or this, this thing that you've called me to that I don't like? I don't enjoy it. It's not what I want to be doing. There's no fruit. How long, O oh Lord? Here's the good news about this, though, is that the Bible tells us, if we look at Isaiah 55 here, uh, it tells us very specifically that uh, Isaiah 55, 10, and 11, I'll read it for you. For as the rain and the snow come down from heaven and do not return there, but water the earth, making it bring forth and sprout, giving seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so shall my word be that goes out from my mouth. It shall not return to me empty, but it shall accomplish that which I purpose and shall succeed in the thing for which I sent it. So you see, if we're in the ministries that we're supposed to be in, if we're in the places that God has placed us using our gifts effectively, then God's word will accomplish that which it was sent out to do. That's, that's some good news, right? For those moments where we say, how long, O oh Lord? The answer is, until it works. Until what I've said to pass will. And it will pass because I've set it out to do that which I've willed it to do. So it's going to work. So for some of us here, as we sit here, we need to take heart. We need to understand that God's word has a purpose, a purpose in the world around us. And it is our job to respond accordingly and to resolve ourselves, to remain where God has placed us. And like I said earlier, some of us are in a place where our, our simple response to God just needs to be, here I am send me. Right, some of us may have been at the church for a decent amount of time, long enough to know uh, who Christ is to, for God to save us, but we've been afraid to, to step up in ministry roles. Right? As, as I heard today, looking for Awana volunteers, some of us know that we need to you know, step up and serve in Awana, or step up and serve in, in whatever capacity God has called us to. Right? Use the gifts that God has given us for his purpose. And we do that, we have to understand that we do that in response to the salvation that God has given us through his son Christ. Right? We don't do this begrudgingly or, or, okay, I guess nobody else will do it, so it's my turn to step up, or I didn't do it last year, so I can do it this year. We do this in response to the grace we've been shown, glorifying God, saying, yeah, it's me. I want to do this. I want to go. It doesn't matter if other people sign up, I'm still doing it. It doesn't matter if we don't need to, I know God has called me to this. And lastly, some of us here may need to be in the, in the realization phase, right, where we need to realize, uh, for whatever reason, that not only does God exist, but he is holy, and we are cursed to death because of his holiness. Right, you see, I, I went through a long period of time where, like I said, I, I was not a believer and very openly despised Christianity and, and who God was and 
I didn't get to keep living that way. Right? And either God showed up and transformed my life, which thankfully happened, or one day I encounter God and he's still holy and he's still in control and my sin still doesn't let me live in compatibility with God. So regardless of where you find yourself today, there's a response that needs to be made. It's either, woe is me, and receive the grace that God has given us freely, or it's here am I, send me, because of the grace that God gave us, or it's how long, O oh Lord, must I continue to serve you, because we ought to continue to serve him. So as I pray today and close this, I ask that you would uh, look inward and say, God, where is it that you would have me be in, in response to this message? And then respond accordingly. Let's pray. God, I thank you for your word. And I thank you that you have allowed us to discover what it is you want for us. Lord, I ask that if there are those here who don't know you as Savior, that you would call them now to a relationship with you. That you would transform their lives like you transformed mine and Isaiah's. That you would, Lord, call them to righteousness. We thank you for what it is your son did for us on the cross, Lord. We are not worthy or deserving of it, and yet you still chose to do that because of your love for us. So God, I ask that we would respond then with love and service in your kingdom and in your glory. I pray these things in your name. Amen.